Oh, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure and a privilege for me to be able to bring to you the message from God's Word this morning. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab, as the Lord had said. If we have a look at the picture that is coming up, we will see the land that is being talked about, the promised land uh, the Israelites were to go into from the top of Mount Nebo. So have we got it there, please? There we go. So we're standing on the top of Mount Nebo. And over here on the left... Have you turned the green? Yep, she's on. It was there, but it's not uh, coming up. But anyway, on the very left, on uh, your very left, is the Dead Sea. And so as you look from the Dead Sea, you come across towards the centre and there's like a little hill. That's the city of Palms, Jericho. So Moses is standing on top of Mount Nebo looking to the Dead Sea, to Jericho, and about 20 kilometres over the hill from Jericho we'll find Jerusalem. And as we go further to the right, so we are looking up into the Jordan Valley and all those places that uh, were mentioned in our scripture reading this morning. It was the view that uh, Moses saw, but as we read too, that he was not allowed to enter. The Israelites grieved then for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days until the time of weeping and mourning was over. It's a bit of a sad story in some respects, isn't it, when we think about it? Moses, the great leader of the Israelites, is no longer. And the mantle of leadership of God's people now falls onto the shoulders of Joshua. It's a time of transition and ending followed by a new beginning. And it occurred to me only this morning as I was thinking about this, that what we saw yesterday with the coronation of King Charles was another time of transition. His mother has passed. Now we're entering into a new era with a new king. Transition is what we're looking at this morning because it's the situation that we are facing as a church. Peter and Margie have moved on. And so this ending means the leading to a new beginning for this church as a community of faith, as well as for whomever is called to be our new pastor. It's the closing of one chapter and readiness for the opening of another. Before I go on, it may help for us to have some idea of what we mean by way of definition of that word transition or, if you like, change. They can be used uh, as synonyms, but when I think about transition, it's more than change. It is a change that is happening perhaps with a, a sense of purpose and deliberate intent. And so the definition of transition is this. The natural process of disorientation and reorientation that marks the turning points of the path of growth. What we have known is no longer what is coming we're not sure about. And so we are in a, a period just wondering what is going to be happening. And this is where transition comes in. I want us to notice too the mention of the word natural. We as people are constantly experiencing transition as we grow and develop. When we start and finish our schooling, when we join the workforce in relation to relationships that we may have, the loss of loved ones, especially parents or a spouse, moving home. And as the case for what we're talking about this morning, retirement. Let me bring this closer to home and I hope you don't mind me mentioning some specific names. It's not meant to be an exhaustive list, but in the course of the past five years, while Peter and Margie have been with us, 
Pauline Webb and Aylith Lean, Rob and Elaine, Faye, have moved home. We've had people like Mary and Victor and Pauline, Jeff and Ricky, Larice, John and Noel join our church family along with others. Les and Shirley have come from Victoria, Dennis from Tasmania and the Booker family from New South Wales. Dorothy Greenwood has celebrated her 100th birthday and Pat Bagley too is soon to reach this milestone. We've also mourned the loss of people, Ken and Graham Rogerson and Graham Strudwick, Peter and Marion, Dares and Olive and Derek. But then as part of the cycle of life, we've had people become grandparents and great-grandparents. And we only need to look at Alan and Elaine this morning to see that they're a bit like cats that have scored the cream because they've had a new little great-granddaughter born into their family. What a joy to be able to share such a special time as this. For you and most certainly for me, the recalling of such names and the memories associated with them is summed up in one word, and that word is relationship. Ministry is about relationship, especially the building of relationships with people. So when a minister moves on for whatever reason, and I was thinking of the number of times that that has happened to me, leaving these relationships represents a loss. Not a loss of things themselves, but of one's investment in them and especially about the preciousness of time spent with people. And as such, it's a loss that's going to be mourned. John Norse in his book, The Christian Ministry, in talking about the grief associated with a minister's leaving, says this. I discovered it was critical for the congregation and for me to express our grief. And that resolution of grief means an open trust relationship with leaders and peers, which has been growing throughout a ministry. I am convinced that a support community is essential for working through one's grief. God's love does come through persons, but only to the extent that I open myself to his love through them and admit my needs. It's the reality that says the Christian experience is not a solo flight. It's a journey in the company of religious fellow travellers. And if we are going to wear the badge that proclaims that we are Christians, then we must involve ourselves deeply with one another. We have no alternative. Another writer by the name of Robert Kemper in reference to the impending loss of a minister from a church says, in regards to intentionally acknowledging what is happening, and this was our experience last week, as we said goodbye to Peter and Margie, that they are giving each other the recognition that they, that we, have loved and cared for each other. That our tears express the depth and the power of the relationship that we have enjoyed and the giving of verbal griefs expresses the mutual appreciation for the joys and the sorrows which have been shared in intimate relationships. Speaking for myself, from experience, and for us as a church family, having said goodbye to Peter and Margie, such times as we are going through are not easy. But with hindsight, I mention these things because a healthy farewell, a healthy farewell better equips all of us, not only for such future situations, but in our ongoing personal journeys as well. It's the social dimension to our spiritual path. I'm going to come back to this faith aspect of ministry transition in a moment, but now I want to mention something else that's related to ministry 
and the grief that's associated with transition. Because when faced with an ending, there are what is known as externals and internals. Externals involve such things as packing up, organising somewhere else to have to move to, to live, tidying up loose ends. It's those little practical things that need to be done. The internals deal with the emotions, the mental state, one's frame of mind, and it's not such an easy thing to do. When it comes to clergy families, one writer has suggested that the internal wrestling with all that is going on is felt more acutely because when a person or a couple give their lives to God in Christian service, there is a, relatively, a relative loss of control. By choice, by chance, and by circumstance, ministers give up control of their lives. And the reason for this is we have been called to serve. While Peter and Margie didn't have any family with them during their transition, it's worth pointing out that the spouse of a minister and the whole relationship between a minister and a spouse is subjected to stress and strain not normally associated in other people intensive professions. Nancy Pannell, herself a minister's wife, refers to the sharing of a decision to move, the sharing of the grief at leaving, the sharing of the gifts that are given and the sharing of the adventure of the waiting new experiences. I don't believe that Bible college adequately prepares a spouse for all that happens in ministry. So it's really helpful to be a part of a congregation where there can be support and care. And that's something that we've been able to express to Peter and Margie. The second of our Bible readings this morning is about Jesus' ascension and he's saying goodbye to his 11 remaining disciples. These are men whom he not only called to follow, but in the course of their three years together, knew everything about them. How hard it must have been to leave them after all that they had been through together. And yet he also knew that he had accomplished the task for which he had come. His disciples were ready to go into all the world, to tell the good news of Jesus to all whom they met. But they couldn't start until Jesus left and the Holy Spirit came. And can we grasp something of the sense of how the disciples must have felt with their master leaving? Would they be on their own? How could they go on? Would they have the courage to go on. Thankfully, from our vantage point in the 21st century, we can praise God because the arrival of the Holy Spirit answered these questions in the positive. This time of transition that we are currently going through as a community of faith also provides us with an opportunity to grow in our faith. On a number of occasions over the years, I've been heard to say that living by faith is an adventure. But remember, as a church community, we face the future together. The opening six verses of Isaiah chapter 51 are a reminder to the people of Israel who have been in captivity in Babylon that their God is a faithful God. And the prophet says, look to the rock from which you were cut and to the quarry from which you were hewn. In other words, look back to the mighty acts of God in history as evidence that he will continue to work in our lives. 
It's all about trust. It's about faith. It's about bringing everything to God in prayer. Because the Christian journey is an adventure. As members of a church being involved in the call of a new minister, continuing to support the church leadership team and prayer and seeking the will of God helps to promote community and gives us a sense of personal involvement in the process that is taking place. Such an attitude, especially when we look back after the appointment of someone, should help us to not only provide an appreciation of faith, but also increase our faith. And when we think about the circumstance that we see Ryan and Adriel and their family with us, I'm excited because God has been at work. And it's something to look forward to, to say, well, what is he going to do with us as far as the future is concerned? And this brings me then to my final point to mention, the arrival of a new minister. B.W. Libby said, I am convinced that consciously made decisions when conscientiously acted upon by both pastor and congregation will consistently aid the start-up process. And this again strikes at why I am talking about healthy transition this morning. A new move, even if it is eagerly anticipated, is always accompanied by a certain amount of anxiety. Joan Furlonger was a member of the Sunnybank Church of Christ in Brisbane. And I'm sure that she and her husband, Jim, would have fitted in really well in our church community here. But Joan and I served together on what was known as the Advisory Board of Churches of Christ in Queensland, the body that was responsible for the placement of ministers in that state. And in regards to caring for and encouraging a minister and his family, this is what she had to say, because she was a, a very caring type of person. This can begin in practical ways before, before they even arrive to take up their ministry, so that they will feel welcome and as comfortable as possible right from the beginning. It can be a difficult and lonely time for them as they try to become part of the church family where they probably know no one. Make sure you go out of your way to make them feel welcome and to be a part of the group. And I would certainly trust that this has been the case for Ryan and Adriel and the boys as they have come amongst us. While it will take a little while to deal with our grief and be ready to extend a warm welcome in anticipation to Greg and Robin. Let's remember to do the same as was done to Peter and Margie five years ago, because as we do, it'll go a long way towards ensuring another successful chapter in the life and the ministry and the history of the Victor Harbour Church of Christ. And as we do, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Let's pray. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are part of the body of Christ here in this place. We're mindful that we are going through a period of transition, but we thank you that you are with us and as we've just been reminded, you are a faithful God. We thank you for bringing Ryan and Adriel to us. And as we wait to see the outcome of the vote about Greg and Robin, so our faith is strong and rests in you. We look forward to a, a vibrant future as a community of faith, making a, a difference in this wider community of which we are a part. And may it be that as each one of us plays a part in some way, 
that we might know the joy that comes from serving you, our loving Heavenly Father. And it's to your glory we would pray these things. Amen.